that King Ghazar, the great hero of Tibetan people, confronted the Chingba Nabu monster here. For three years, King Ghazar was unable to defeat it, but then he received some divine assistance. The gods informed him that the monster was weakest at dawn. Armed with this knowledge and with his sword, King Ghazar was finally able to vanquish the monster of Shuba Castle. So it may be a little bit cramped in here, but I'm still completely impressed by the actual structure. I mean, if you look over here, you can still see the remains of wood over a thousand years old, keeping the structure together. And then if you come and look over there, you can see some holes from which you can look outside. Extremely impressive. I'm intrigued to discover what the differences are between a Tibetan castle and the castles I've visited in Europe. In this part of Tibet, there used to be many castles scattered around, but only a few remain. It's a feature of Tibetan castles that in their design, they take into consideration the natural conditions locally. So they're all different, depending on where they are. There are three main types, built of either stone, mud or wood. Shuba Castle is a stone and wood structure. Well, our luck was bound to run out sooner or later. We've taken a wrong turn from Suba Castle and find ourselves 150 kilometers adrift of our next destination. In the end, our detour is 300 kilometers long, but at least we make it to a sacred Tibetan lake, a place you can't and won't want to miss. Well, we finally made it to the Basong Swar Lake, and I'll tell you what, it's really been worth the wait. This place is amazing. It's so beautiful. Um, it's actually the holy lake for the red sect of uh, Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, Basong Swar actually means green colored lake. And I think it's pretty clear why it's called that. Have a look at that. Basong Swar Lake is as green and clear as pure jade. And the swimming fish can easily be seen in it. Known as the pearl of Southern Tibet, it is acclaimed in Tibetan culture as a paradise on earth due to the richness of its natural beauty. This is one of the most widely visited tourist spots in Tibet, recognized as a world tourist attraction by the World Tourism Organization. There's more to the lake's appeal, however, than just aesthetics. On the island, there is a small but exquisite temple. It was built over a thousand years ago during the Tang Dynasty by the Red Sect of Tibetan Buddhism. Monks of the Nyingma sect, because they wore red hats, were better known as the Red Sect. Founded in the 11th century, it is the oldest sect of Tibetan Buddhism. It observed practices of Buddhism that were deeply rooted in the Chubo kingdom of the 8th century. So the sect called itself Nyingma, a word meaning ancient and old in the Tibetan language. Because of its age, the sect is closely associated with animism and with the worship of sexual reproductive organs. I haven't actually had any lunch yet, so it's very kind of them. I haven't had any lunch, and everyone's looking at me um, very enviously from the sides. It's good. Ah, see, see. Mm. Good. good beef and bread, solid mountain food by the lake. So uh, I've just had a little chat with, uh, with the, the very welcoming people here and uh, they've explained to me all of the dishes. So uh, what I just ate was some good beef, solid beef, very good. And uh, also I tried some of the uh, organic pig from, uh, from this area, which was very nice. Uh, what you can see there, which looks like a beef jerky, is actually uh, yak's meat, uh, which I've tried once. Very nice, very nice. We've got spicy chicken here, uh, some more beef, 
some vegetables. This is great. This is a spicy chili sauce if you really want to, it's a bit hot today, but if you really want to spice up your day, here's some of that. And then a uh, good bit of tea to uh, wash it all down. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> So we're at the Mila mountain entrance and guess how high we are? 5,013 meters, 25 centimeters high. That is extremely high. In fact, that's the highest we've been this entire trip. I'm not actually feeling any altitude sickness, which is strange. And um, I've been told not to get too excited, even though this is the highest I've ever been in my whole life, ever. So um, I'm going to try and not get too excited, but what I am going to do is I'm going to throw lots of Tibetan Buddhist good wishes up in the air. So follow me. Now, my Tibetan good wishes. Yay! 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 This is it, the final day of our wonderful adventure. We finally made it to Lhasa, and I'm stood here on this beautiful and bright sunny morning in front of the Jokung Temple, which was built in the seventh century and is arguably, the, it, no, it is the heart of the Tibetan people here. And if you have a quick look around, you can see that in fact, this is the Bokum Square, which is the heart of the city. For most Tibetans, the Jokung Temple is one of the most sacred and important temples in Tibet. Built in the 7th century, it commemorates the marriage of the Tang Princess Wang Chang to King Tsongtsen Gampuo. The temple stands above a pool that the princess likened to a witch's heart. In long streams, the pious Tibetan pilgrims walk clockwise around Barkor Square, chanting prayers or performing full prostrations. Pilgrims, like the ones we met during our tea and horse trail adventure, journey from all over Tibet to worship here. It's easy to be swept up in the wondrous swell of humanity filling Barkor Street, which surrounds the Jokung Temple. It's a lively and bustling place, roughly 600 meters long. The whole of Lhasa has a distinct religious feel about it, but Barkor Street is both a religious and trade center. You can pick up all sorts of goods here, from food and traditional Tibetan merchandise to all sorts of religious artifacts. I'm also very surprised to find such an international vibe in Lhasa. There certainly seem to be as many foreigners here as I've ever seen in any Chinese city. An uncommon sight for some, a normal thing in Lhasa. Tourists and pilgrims, tradition and modernity, both seamlessly mixing in this part of the world. Lhasa was our final destination, and it's also the final destination on the Chamagudao for our tea. So after eight days of adventure, I think it's uh, quite apt to uh, perhaps uh, barter for some tea and see if I can take some home uh, back to Beijing. So have a look. This is actually Yu Yunnan tea. Yunnan Xiaguan something cha. Well, obviously my Chinese isn't good enough. But uh, if you have a quick look, they actually have the characters emblazoned across the block of tea. So uh, Xiaguan um, is, uh, is what it says here. Signifies it's been, uh, it's uh, tea produced in Yunnan. So uh, it's followed our entire journey of the Chamagu Dao. Pretty interesting. 
So I've just purchased myself some uh, Yunnan tea, and uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, it's pretty significant that uh, well, they were trying to sell me the Sichuan tea, but I actually wanted tea that's followed the exact same route that we have over the last eight days. So uh, I'll happily drink this and uh, have some great memories. Shukwai yeah. Well, um, gentlemen's just been filling me in. So, uh, the products here are actually from India, and uh, that, that kind of gets me thinking about how this, you know, Lhasa really still is a, uh, a hub of uh, economic and cultural exchange, much as it has been for, for, for hundreds of years. And uh, in a way, you know, Nothing really has changed from uh, from the from the uh, Chamagudao and the people bringing all their goods here. Incredible. The cultural mix of traditional Tibetan culture and Western influences is clear to see. This is especially true in art circles, where Tanka, the traditional Tibetan paintings, sit side by side with oil paintings depicting everyday Tibetan life. Tana Palace gives the impression not of having been built by man, but of having grown there so perfectly does it fit in with its surroundings. I'm humbled by its beauty and magnificence as much as the Tibetans, and all those who respect and are fascinated by Tibetan culture. Well, I'm stood in front of the extremely impressive Patala Palace, and uh, I'm trying to put myself in the position of the Ma Guoto along the Chama Gudao because this is actually the first thing they would see from miles away. And I'm sure that there would be a huge sense of relief as they saw the Patala Palace across the landscape. However, in a sad way, this is actually the end of, uh, of our adventure along the Chama Gudao. And it really has been something deeply, deeply impressive for me. I mean, I can't go through all of the highlights, but possibly the, the pilgrimage and uh, watching the people and, and uh, how long those, uh, that it takes for them to arrive here in Nasser. And also, uh, surviving Death Valley was obviously a big, big highlight. But uh, in any case, this is just the end of the beginning. So make sure you join us for another travel log special. I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>